Thank you very much for joining today. And we will be discussing the Bhagavad Gita, over 75 verses in the next uh, year or so. And uh, there is a, just a few logistics about the Zoom. I have muted all of you so that it doesn't disturb everyone else. But if any of you are not able to hear, you can, you can type in the chat box. And toward the end of the class, we will be having question answers. We plan to have a, a more interactive format. But we will, that format will evolve because we have a large number of participants right now. So we will work out the format. But if there are any questions during the course of the class, you can also raise your hand. If you just look at the Zoom interface, you can see that. But usually we will have some time for question answers at the end. So let's begin. Om Akyana Timirandasya Gyana Anjana Shalakaya Chakshur Nirutamena Tasmin Shri Gurave So I have framed the Bhagavad Gita in terms of 51 questions. Questions that deal with our daily life as well as questions that deal with our spiritual journey. And we'll be sharing these questions shortly after this program with you. Uh, uh, and... Each session will be discussing one one question based on one verse from the Bhagavad Gita. So today we will start with the most basic question. What is the Gita and how is it relevant for me? So we are going to discuss based on Bhagavad Gita 1 1 chapter 1 text 1. So it, it begins with Dutrashtra Vacha Dharmakshetre Kurukshetre Samaveta Yutsavaha Mamakaha Pandava Shaiva Kimakurvat Sanjaya. So it is Dutrashtra who is the blind king of a powerful kingdom called the Kuru kingdom in ancient India several thousands of years ago and he's asking this question over here and he's asking this question to his assistant Sanjaya that a war is going to happen soon at a place called Kurukshetra and he refers to it as Dharmakshetra Kurukshetra that on that Kurukshetra which is a holy place I'll come to the significance of the word Dharma soon Dharmakshetra Kurukshetra Samaveta Yutsavaha that when both the armies have assembled to fight, Mamakaha Pandavas Jaiva, when mine and the Pandavas came akur with the Sanjaya. So we will talk about the Bhagavad Gita in three broad terms in, in historical terms, in uh, Transhistorical or universal terms and in the terms of the contemporary context. So the Bhagavad Gita is a part of the Mahabharat. The Mahabharat is a vast epic from ancient India. In fact, it is considered to be the longest poem in world history. Previously, before Indian literature and Indian culture was discovered by the West a few hundred years ago. The Germanic Sagas, Ilya and Odyssey were considered to be the longest poems in world history. But the Mahabharat is at least seven times longer than the Iliad and the Odyssey combined together. It's a vast saga of uh, intrigue, romance, war, politics, and all the dynamics that could make a thriller movie or a thriller novel. And right in the Mahabharat, just before its climactic moment, 
that is the whole mahabharat leading to a war and the now the context of the bhagavad gita is at one level very important and at another level the bhagavad gita transcends its context and that tension between the contextual and the transcontextual is what we will address today so that we can go into the universal themes of the gita but let's understand the context first so basically the gita is spoken by krishna to arjuna so the gita is we could say two nested conversations so the outer conversation is between dhritarashtra and sanjay now these names especially for those who are not from a indian background can be a little confusing and intimidating also so those names are not particularly relevant for the essential message of the gita but understanding the context can help so now when krishna krishna and arjuna they are on the war field and we will come to the context of krishna and arjuna in the next class but the gita is itself a conversation between krishna and arjuna and the dynamics of their relationship and their dialogue will be discussed in the next session in more detail but here specifically we look at that so i said the gita is like two nested conversations one is between krishna and arjuna which is the heart of the gita so krishna is considered to be god descended to the world and he is playing the role of a human being he is playing the role of a charioteer of arjuna and he is speaking as a counselor as a mentor to arjuna and that is the heart of the gita but before the gita gets to that core it begins with another con- conversation that is between dhritarashtra and sanjay and dhritarashtra's blindness has significance both from the perspective of the mahabharat and the gita because he is blind he is man- he is not he can't be officially fully the king and he's often manipulated by his son and his son is the main villain in the mahabha in the mahabharat and the war has happened because duryodhan son of dhritarashtra has repeatedly committed atrocities against the pandavas who are virtuous and dhritarashtra is worried and he's asking what is happening on the battlefield he knows the war is about to begin so he wants to know what's happening in the war who is likely to win and so that itself is the second conversation within which the gita is framed that's between dhritarashtra and sanjay now dhritarashtra's blindness also signifies the spiritual blindness that most of us have in the world when we live so there is we could say that in the bhagavad gita dhritarashtra is congenitally blind is conge- is, is blind from birth and in the bhagavad gita in the first chapter itself in its context arjuna will become circumstantially blind circumstantially blind means not that he loses his physical eyes but if we consider the eyes as the tools for us to see and do things in life he becomes so confused that he is not able to function and that causes his breakdown and that breakdown is what leads to speaking of the bhagavad gita so there is dhritarashtra with congenital blindness and there is arjuna who gets circumstantial blindness not in a literal sense but in a effectual practically he is blinded because he doesn't know what to do in fact he himself says i can't see anything my mind is reeling i can't see clearly i can't act clearly act, act properly so now the bhagavad gita's message frees arjuna from his circumstantial blindness but it's significant that dhritarashtra now the bhagavad gita is not a book of magical cures where physical blindness will go away but the blindness signifies inability to see and act properly so arjuna is restored to the right vision and right action but dhritarashtra isn't 
and that itself has its significance. So, to repeat, what is going on is, here the Bhagavad Gita is spoken just before a war is about to begin. And Dhritarashtra is asking, what's happening on the war field? Now, <clears throat> in today's world, the idea of violence and war is uh, something which uh, alarms people. And especially if violence is done in the name of religion, it is even more alarming. And that's why the question comes up, is the Bhagavad Gita, if the Bhagavad Gita is spoken on the battlefield, then is the battle, battlefield literal? Was that battle for real? And wouldn't, if the Bhagavad Gita is a sacred book, wouldn't it stop someone from fighting? But if now it's heard that actually the Bhagavad Gita is spoken so that Arjuna, who was confused and unwilling to fight, he is asked to fight by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. So the context of the Gita is Arjuna is confused if he feels reluctant to fight. And Krishna speaks the Bhagavad Gita and afterward Arjuna's confusion goes away and he starts fighting. So this context itself can be disturbing for many. Now, <clears throat> the context, if we consider broadly, yes, there is a war that happens and that war happens after the Bhagavad Gita is spoken. And yes, before the war, Arjuna is not ready to fight and after the war, he becomes ready to fight. But it's interesting that while this context might simply mean that the Bhagavad Gita was a, was a book spoken to get Arjuna to fight and it is simply inciting violence. But that is hardly reflected by the content of the Gita. Generally, if someone wants to incite someone for violence, really the easiest way to do that is to is to highlight all the wrongs that have been done to them. Generally, whenever any leaders want to incite any riots, they tell, oh, you know, these people are so unfair, these people are so brutal, these people have done this and they've done that and they've done that. And now is the time to get back at them and fight, attack them, destroy them. So now the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita itself is not containing even one reference to the atrocities that the Pandavas, we could say the, the good guys in this year, the virtuous people, the, not even one reference to the many atrocities that they had to go through is mentioned. And the atrocities that they had to go through were many. They... <clears throat> One of them, Bhima, was attempted to be poisoned when he was just a teenager. And they remained silent about it. Now, eating is one of the activities that is, it signifies comfort and joy and homeliness. But that is the activity that was used to poison and kill them. And yet, there's no reference to that. And they were attempted to be burned alive again in a place that was purported to be their home. The whole. And there is no reference to that. And then you top it all off, the Pandava's wife, Draupadi, she was attempted to be publicly dishonored by being disrobed. Now for any person, such a atrocious act of violence is unbearable. For warriors to see their queen attempted to be dishonored is, is infuriatingly unbearable. Just the memory of that is enough to make their blood boil. And if the Bhagavad Gita was spoken just to get somebody to fight, then Krishna didn't have to speak all the philosophy that he spoke. He could just have reminded the Pandavas of all the atrocities, especially the dishonor of Draupadi. And that would have been enough to make their blood boil and make them fight. But there is not a single reference to that at all in the Gita. 
and this absence is very striking. So the, what this points to is that the Bhagavad Gita is not specifically spoken to incite anyone to violence. Then what is it about? And the, the battlefield context of the Gita is seen as so disturbing to some people that some people say that it's just a metaphor. That actually the, the whole setting is simply to convey a message and Kurukshetra, the battlefield is like our body and the Kauravas are many. So there are 100 Kauravas and there are the 5 Pandavas. So the 100 Kauravas represent the many vices within us, the vicious desires within us. And the Pandavas, they represent virtue. So the virtuous desires are few within us, so like that the Pandavas are few. And the Bhagavad Gita is a battle within our own psyche, between our desires. Now this metaphorical reading of the Bhagavad Gita does do away with the discomfort associated with associated with warfare, especially the imagery of a uh, sacred book inciting someone to war. But this is a using this explanation is a intellectual shortcut that does injustice to the contextual framing of the Gita. Sometimes whenever we have to explain something, we, we often choose, just like electricity, water flows along the path of the least resistance. Our, our brains also often look for the easiest explanation. And one explanation that is often used in religious circles to explain difficult concepts is to make them non-literal, to make them symbolic, to make them metaphorical. And that way, that's a convenient intellectual shortcut. But it doesn't explain why does the Gita, if, if that's just a metaphor, why use a metaphor to a metaphor like this, which is obviously going to detract people from that message. Now, normally, if you, we are watching a movie, and the movie's climactic war is to take place, say maybe Star Wars, the Justice League, or whatever. And just the biggest war is about to take place. And if all the audience is waiting to watch that, then would anyone insert a long philosophical conversation right before that? It doesn't seem plausible. So, oh, normally, a war is a place of action. It's not a place of deep contemplation. Yes, of course, sometimes if death, if, we, if during the course of the war someone dies and then there's a lull in the war for some time, that's, that's the time for reflection. But when the war is about to begin, it's, it seems unrealistic that somebody would use a, a philosophical conversation at that time but again, that is the, the unlikeliness of the Gita setting points to something. And that is its universality. For most people, philosophy is not a thing that they give much time for. In fact, a prominent atheistic scientist a few years ago wrote a book and he said philosophy is dead. And science has taken its place. But ironically, he said philosophy is dead. And then almost his whole book is about philosophy. And there is very little science in his book. In one of our later sessions, we'll discuss about the relationship between science, philosophy and spirituality in more detail. But suffice it to say is that science is the question of 
addresses the question of how. How do things operate? Mm. But what exists and why? That is not primarily a scientific question. That is primarily a philosophical question. So, philosophy is something which is uh, in the background that shapes our worldview and our actions. And most of us are not really interested in philosophy. But we all have some philosophy. If we have not thought about philosophy, then it doesn't mean that we don't have a philosophy. It simply means we have an unthought philosophy. It simply means that we are living according to some, some vision of the world, some worldview, some philosophy that we have not really thought about, that has just subconsciously uh, assimilated, percolated into us because of our upbringing, because of our culture, because of the movies that we watch, because of so many subliminal influences over us. So we all have some philosophy or the other. And the Bhagavad Gita describes its setting that a war is about to begin and before that war, the main warrior over there, Arjuna, describe, get, develops a case of nerves. He becomes, he becomes unnerved. Now, his becoming unnerved is not because of poverty, as we will discuss in the next session specifically about what made him unnerved. And, uh, but the point is he gets unnerved, he becomes confused and he puts aside his bow saying, I can't fight. Visrujyasasharam chapam shokasam vignamanasaha. The last verse of the first chapter describes how Arjuna put aside his bow saying, I can't fight. And when he says that, that is the time after the second chapter, Krishna starts speaking. So, when a warrior is about to fight the war, that is the time of maximum urgency. And yet, even when we are acting with a very high, act with a very high sense of urgency, there is some worldview that animates us. And Arjuna is a quintessential go-getter. He is a person who had achieved practically all that was considered glorious in his times. He was a warrior and he had achieved such mastery in archery that he was widely considered to be the best archer of his times. He had even performed such austerities that he, by the power of those austerities, had ascended to higher levels of existence, something which was very, very rare, even amongst the sages who had renounced the world. So what Arjuna had wanted to get some, some celestial powers, and he had set his mind on that, and he had got that by performing immense austerities. So Arjuna was a quintessential go-getter. In today's world, in today's uh, corporate language, you could say that Al Arjuna was the quintessential high achiever. Not the high, the high achiever, the, you could say the highest achiever. He had achieved what most people can only dream about and some people can't even dream about it. So he was a go-getter, but what the Bhagavad Gita's context says is highlights that even a go-getter needs to think where to go and what to get. Where to go and what to get. We are all busy doing many things in our life. But the big question is always, what is it that matters? What is it that is worth going towards? What is it that is worth getting? And if that question is not answered, then quite often we work very hard, but what we get at the end of the hard work, provided we succeed in that hard work, 
what we get turns out to be not as fulfilling as we had thought it would be. It turns out to be quite anticlimactic, in fact. So it's like somebody is busy climbing up a ladder, but they're so busy climbing up the ladder that they forget to check whether the ladder is leaning on the right wall. And then they end up climbing up high up a wrong wall. So what the Bhagavad Gita's context highlights is that even in the moment of the greatest urgency, even at that time, reflection is essential. And now we might say it's unrealistic that the uh, if a war was about to start, the warriors would stop for a philosophical discussion to take place. Now the Bhagavad Gita is in one sense long, there are 700 texts in it. But in another sense, if you consider, it's not very long, 700 verses, if you just consider Sanskrit of the Bhagavad Gita, it's actually, the number of words are maybe not more than what could fill the front and back pages of the New York Times or the Times of India. It's, it's not much. So the whole, whole Bhagavad Gita is to be recited by somebody who is fluent in that language of Sanskrit. It might take an hour or a little more. Today, when we recite the Bhagavad Gita fully, maybe on some special occasions, it takes most people two to three hours. Because we are not familiar with Sanskrit. But whatever it is, how, how would it be realistic that the Gita would be spoken on a war field? So, I'll retrace the flow now. What I'm discussing is, we discuss the contextual aspect. So, I said that the contextual, to say that it is simply metaphorical, is an intellectual shortcut, which, which does injustice to the Gita. Then if it is literal, if it is historical, is the Gita inciting Arjuna to fight a war? No, but there is no inflammatory speech at all in the Gita. Uh, then, then why, why does the Gita have have this context, this framing at all, where it is spoken on a water war field? So that question we are addressing, saying that among all of us who have busy things, who have urgent things to do, few of us would have anything as urgent as a war to fight. Among all of us who are achievers, few of us would be as high achievers as Arjuna is. So Arjuna is a high achiever and he is, we could say the highest achiever and the biggest war, winning which would give him the highest laurels that he could ever seek. So oh, that war is about to fight. So it is, we could say, the situation that calls for the most immediate action. And is at that time when the Bhagavad Gita, when Arjuna pauses and the Bhagavad Gita is spoken, that context illustrates how important it is to have a philosophical worldview, to have philosophy inform our worldview and a well thought philosophy at it. So Arjuna stops to ask the question, what really counts? If I'm going to fight this war, it's going to lead to bloodshed. Is the bloodshed worth it? Why am I fighting this war? So, what is the right thing to do in life? That is the defining question which drives the Bhagavad Gita. The same word, Dharma, which begins the Bhagavad Gita. The first word of the Bhagavad Gita is Dharma Kshetre, Kuru Kshetre. So, Dharma. Now, the word Dharma is roughly translated as religion. But that is a oversimplified understanding of that word. It's oversimplified so much to the con to the point of being uh, being distorted. Dharma is not just some religion in the sense of some uh, something which we do say associated with the temple or a church or something like that. Dharma essentially means the right thing to do. The word Dharma comes from the word dhru. Dhru is to sustain. So, sustain means that underlying dharma, there is understanding, there is order to the world. 
and we need to function in a way that is harmonious with the order of the world. Just like a simple example. So if we go on the, if we drive a car and go on the road, then the road has its own order. The, the road transport system is a huge whole. And when we drive on the road, we become a part of that road transport system. So, and there is a right way to drive. The right way to drive is the way we will drive safely and smoothly and will enable others to drive safely and smoothly. Now, this the right way to drive does not take away our freedom to go to the destination that we want to go to. But it ensures that whatever destination we want to go to, we can go with the least risk for ourselves and for others. So dharma is similar in the context of the whole universe, of all of existence in fact. Just as when we join a road, we drive on a road, we are a part of a whole bigger than ourselves and we have to belong to the whole harmoniously. Similarly, we live in a world which is far bigger than ourselves. And we are parts of the whole. We take a lot from the world. We take air, water, food. And we need to belong harmoniously to the world. So the right thing to do is not some restrictive or regressive moral codes defined by some old-fashioned people. Dharma, as it is understood in a holistic way, is basically the right way to belong to the universe. And the right way to belong doesn't necessarily, just like the right way to drive doesn't mean that we have to go to a particular destination alone or we have to stick to a particular lane alone. We can change lanes when we want to. We can go to different destinations we want to. But according to the rules. So similarly, dharma is basically Within dharma, there are multiple levels of dharma, there are multiple uh, practices of dharma and there is a lot of variability but still there is a right way to belong and Arjuna is confused about that. Now what is the right way to belong for me? So what is the right way to belong means? See we all have... Um, we all belong to different holes. Say for example, we belong to a particular country. Then we belong to a particular gender. We belong to a particular profession. We belong to a particular religion. Now all these are various holes that we belong to. And sometimes these belongings what we belong to, these different belongings pull us in different directions. Say, for example, now somebody say belongs to India and say, now it is not so much the case, but during the time of the, the Cold War was going on, at that time there was significant amount of tension between India and America. Although India was non-aligned, it was broadly seen to be aligned with Soviet Russia, to some extent at least. So, even when Shila Prabhupada brought his disciples to India, many of them were suspected to be American because they were Americans. Just by being Americans, they were suspected. So, basically, now so say now we if there's a there's a tension between say India and America because of some reason, and then there is an Indian in America. Now at one level you're from India, so that's one sense of belonging. But then you're living in America, and that's another sense of belonging. Now if somebody is asked to say, you know, which country are you faithful to? Now that might be a little difficult for people to say. Now if you consider that 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 the same situation can become more acute. Say if we are working at a job and we have some important project to do at work and we also have some important family obligation. Say maybe the birthday or the anniversary or some other event at the home. And then there's a project, project with a deadline and there's a big emergency 
it work so then we belong to a family and that belonging pulls us in a particular direction and we belong to a, a company and that belonging pulls us in another direction so when we are pulled in different directions by the by the by the things that we belong to then which direction do we go in so arjuna for some people one extreme as i said one simplified over simplified understanding of the gita is that arjuna was was a peace loving person who was incited to war by krishna and that is a distorted understanding which i explained earlier the other is that oh arjuna was a warrior and he suddenly developed uh, pre war jitters sometimes there are new no, novice soldiers who go first time into the war some people have a romanticized idea of war oh i'll be a great hero and i'll win uh, medals and every i'll be feted by everyone but when they go really and see the brutality of war they are scared they drop their guns and run away no it is in some ways to prevent these jitters from disrupting an army's plan that desertion in an army is considered a is a very serious crime a soldier cannot just run away from the war field so some people say that arjuna just developed a case of jitters but arjuna had had fought many many wars in the past and it was not just simple jitters about fighting about bloodshed and if you see if we we'll read the first chapter of the bhagavad gita not even once does arjuna mention fear of his own death as the cause of not fighting he has second thoughts of second thoughts about fighting definitely he has second thoughts but not once does he say that oh what if i die i don't want to die that's why i don't want to fight that doesn't come at all so so he is not definitely it's not just simply a case of him developing some jitters because of which he doesn't want to fight then what's happening so the bhagavad gita here we have to go little deeper into the concept of dharma as i said dharma has multiple meanings but dharma essentially means the right thing to do and the right thing to do is determined by the whole that we belong to if we are on the road we have to belong follow the rules of the road so arjuna felt pulled by two sense of senses of belonging that that is in sanskrit called the kula dharma and the kshatriya dharma so kula dharma is that he belonged to a particular dynasty that is the kuru dynasty and it was members of his own dynasty who were fighting against him and thus he felt that as a member of a dynasty my dynasty, i have to, i have to protect my family members or at the very least i should not be the cause of their destruction so his kula dharma pulled him in a particular direction the sense of belonging to a family meant that to dynasty meant i should not fight against the dynasty members but then he was also a kshatriya kshatriya is a simple translation would be a warrior but a more accurate translation would be a martial guardian of society kshatra is hurt trayate is to protect from so the one who protects people from getting hurt and for protecting thus one who sometimes uses force also so that is a martial guardian of society and as a martial guardian of society arjuna had a duty to protect people from aggress to protect uh, protect his uh, citizens protect his kingdom from aggressors and the uh, the opposite party had definitely been aggressors as i mentioned they had tried to openly dishonor a woman they had tried to conspire to burn and poison and all this they had done while occupying the royal throne or being very near to taking complete power so if such people were given untrammeled power 
then the havoc that they would wreak on society would be unimaginable. So it was his duty that people who were so vicious, that they be eliminated. At least they not be in power. So he was pulled by these two senses of belonging. His Kula Dharma, his sense of belonging to a dynasty, pulled him toward protecting his dynasty. His sense, his Kshatriya Dharma, his sense of being a martial guardian of society, pulled him towards guarding society against those who were aggressors. Now, what does he do if the aggressors are relatives? So these two now are pulling him in two exactly opposite directions. His Kula Dharma pulled him to protect and his Kshatriya Dharma pulled him to attack. Or rather you could say his Kshatriya is his Kula Dharma impelled him to protect potential aggressors and his Kshatriya Dharma pulled him to protect the victims of those poten the potential victims of those potential aggressors by neutralizing those aggressors. So when he was pulled in these two ways, then he got confused, he got disoriented. And that's why Arjuna's question, which comes up in the second chapter, 2.7 is, Pruchamitvam dharma sammoodha chetaha That I am confused and please tell me, what should I do? What is the right thing for us to do? So you know, the, the specifics of the battle, now few of us will have to fight a physical war. So the specifics of the historical context don't apply to us. But this principle that we all get pulled in different directions you know, by the different holes that we belong to. You know, we, we may come to a university to study and then we come there as members of a family for whom our, for us, our parents have paid for our studies. And they have expectations from us and we want to study. But then we belong to a peer, we belong to our friend circle and our peer group pulls us. Come on, let's go for this movie. Let's go and watch this match. Let's do this. Let's do that. And this pulling in different directions, sometimes it is, uh, it is overt and we feel it. Sometimes it is so covert that we don't even feel it. We just get pulled away. So when we are pulled in these different directions, how do we resolve this pull? So the Bhagavad Gita talks about, addresses this question of what is the right thing to do by addressing the question, what is the right way to belong? And that right way to the, belong to the universe, to belong to reality itself, is based on a right conception of our identity. And that's why the Bhagavad Gita, in its answer to Arjuna's question, will begin with the question of identity. Who, who are you really, Arjuna? And that is what we'll be discussing in our next session. But this question is universally relevant. What is the right thing to do? When I am pulled in different directions by different forces within me and without me, what is the right thing to do? It is because the Bhagavad Gita... Uh, addresses this universal question. That's why this conversation spoken thousands of years ago has had enduring relevance. Now, some of the greatest uh, minds over history have pondered the Gita. It is the greatest thinkers in the Indian tradition, Shankara, Ramanuja, Madhva, they have commented on the Gita. And some of the most prominent intellectuals from the West, especially those who were open to wisdom from the East, they have also appreciated the Gita. It is Emerson, Thoreau, and scientists like Einstein. So the idea is that the Bhagavad Gita addresses universal questions. And those universal questions are relevant for each one of us. We live in a very complex world today where <clears throat> the agents pulling us have become many, many more because we belong to so many holes now. So how do we decide what is the right thing to do? That guidance the Bhagavad Gita can provide for all of us. So I'll summarize and then we can have a couple of questions. So I spoke today on this first question of what is the Gita and how is it relevant to us? So the Gita I talked about, it's a conversation between Krishna and Arjuna 
framed within a conversation between Dhritarashtra and Sanjay, uh, which the Bhagavad Gita itself is a part of the Mahabharat, which is the longest poem in world history. And then the Bhagavad Gita itself is 700 verses, which is not very large, which can be just put in two pages of a normal sized newspaper. But its enduring relevance comes from its content. And then to understand the content, we look at the context further that it is spoken on the battlefield and the, after it is spoken, a war is fought. So it might seem to have incited war. And it's, that's complete. That's not true because the easiest way to incite war is to just remind, to inflame people's emotions by reminding them of the wrongs that have been done to them. But the Bhagavad Gita doesn't talk anything about the wrongs that have been done to Arjuna or to his family. And the Bhagavad Gita is significantly bringing down throughout its message the, the temperature of emotions by recommending equanimity equipoise. So, there's no hate speech in the Bhagavad Gita at all. Then, so, the Bhagavad Gita is, anyway, it is a philosophical book. It is, not a, uh, it is not a rhetorical book to incite war. So, why would somebody have to speak philosophy uh, to incite someone to war? So, it's not about war at all, primarily. It is the war context is used to drive home the urgency of philosophy as a guidance system for everyone in life. And people, most people don't have much time for philosophy, but then they, it's, they live with an unthought philosophy and their decisions are guided, are determined by factors, by values, by conceptions that they have never contemplated. And that is not the best way to live. So the essential philosophical question the Bhagavad Gita has addresses is, what really counts? What matters? What is it that we should live for? And uh, in that context, I discussed about when the Bhagavad Gita is spoken, there is, not that Arjuna gets overwhelmed by fear, gets pre-war jitters and doesn't want to fight. He doesn't mention fear of his own death even once. Rather, his confusion about what to do arises from conflicting pulls through the holes that he is belonging to. He is his dynastic duty. The school of dharma pulls him against fighting, and his Kshatriya dharma, is being a martial guardian of society, pulls him towards protecting the potential victims from the potential aggressors. So what does one do when the aggressors are relatives? So that is the confusion that, are, that the Bhagavad Gita addresses. And for all of us too, we all belong to different holes. And sometimes these holes pull us in different directions. So the Bhagavad Gita will reveal the biggest hole to which we belong, will reveal the healthiest way to belong to that hole, and then to harmoniously belong to various holes within that. And that message of the Gita we'll start discussing from our next session. So now let's discuss some questions. I see one question over here. Um, is it that Arjuna was put in illusion by Krishna so that Krishna could use Arjuna to speak the Bhagavad, to Bhagavad Gita? Yes, the important thing here is that there are different frames for analyzing. And from one perspective, if we consider Arjuna, he was a close associate of Krishna. He was a great, greatly spiritually evolved person. And such a person is unlikely to be put into illusion or confusion is already enlightened. So, how can such a person get confused? Then yes, it is, it is an arrangement of the Lord. But when we say it's an arrangement of the Lord, that does not mean that it's artificial. 
when Arjuna is confused, afflicted, in fact, he was so confused that his bow started, it was a, it was an ethical crisis for him, which led to him being tear-filled, his bow slipping from his hand. So he was not just acting, he was actually experiencing that. So, if we are analyzing the Gita from a transcendental perspective, then yes, Arjuna was put into an illusion by Krishna's plan. Madhvacharya explains the, that the epics can be analyzed from multiple perspectives. So if we analyze the Gita from an ethical perspective, as we did today, then we, we see what was the ethical crisis for Arjuna, what was the cause of the crisis and how it relates with us. And then we can draw lessons from that. If we say that uh, Arjuna was put into illusion by Krishna, then yes, that that we could say protects Arjuna's enlightened status but then that doesn't that explanation alone doesn't leave us with much to learn so yes if we want to learn some uh, some guidance for our own life then we have to see the guy specific context of Arjuna and seek an explanation from Arjuna's for Arjuna's behavior within that context not there's simply the intervention of the Lord. So both explanations are compatible depending on the frame of reference that we take. Okay. Now, the other questions here. Hmm. So, is the emphasis in the Bhagavad Gita in the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya a recent phenomena? Yes and no. No, because even Jiva Goswami in the Shandarbhas refers to refers to the Bhagavad Gita. And, but yes, also because in the Gaudiya tradition, as the tradition has expanded beyond its roots, the original stress of the Gaudiya tradition was to focus primarily on Krishna Bhakti. Uh, but now the Gaudiya tradition is reaching out to people who who don't even know about God, leave alone, devote themselves to a particular very esoteric conception of God. So the Bhagavad Gita is the Bhagavad Gita's knowledge is presumed by the Gaudiya tradition by its founders. But when it is being spoken to people who do not have that knowledge, then the Bhagavad Gita is a very important foundational book to go into the higher message of the Gita. So, now, what is the, is the, is the Bhagavad Gita uh, later insertion in the Mahabharat based on style of writing, etc.? Well, if you consider the style of writing, the pura, the meter and other things, they are remarkably similar. And from a historical perspective, with all due respect to academic scholars, it's a it's a very iffy game. By iffy game, iffy means it's a based on a lot of ifs, 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 a lot of guesswork. Because ultimately, how do we know whether uh, what was the date at which a particular book was written? If you see India itself, India is a very hot tropical country. And uh, in the past, when paper was not there, things were written on leaves. And leaves don't, whatever was used for writing would not stay for long. So basically, we can, when historians try to determine the date of any book, essentially they try to look for physical remains that suggest the existence or prevalence of, of that book. So they may look for certain architectural remains. They may look for some, uh, some cross-references in other texts. And there are multiple ways. 
but essentially what historians are looking for and what they can find is the end suppose a thief has stolen some money and this thief kept the money in an envelope and uh, histor- the, the, the investigators have a picture of the envelope and they search everywhere where the envelope is where the envelope is and finally they find the envelope but finding the envelope doesn't give them the money back so similarly what we can have knowledge of is the ev- uh, the histor- historical age all that we can determine is that what are the oldest written remains or written references <clears throat> to the gita or the mahabharat but the historians themselves acknowledge that there was a oral tradition that was much more widespread and much more ancient than the written tradition so how old the oral tradition was that is something which there's just no way for empirical historians to know that's why a prominent indologist has said that the that the dating of uh, dating of the indian literature is shrouded in in terrifying darkness and all that anyone can do is just throw pins and wherever they land that's the dates that people give so <clears throat> there are one way so that so that this is basically the whole more important than when a book was written is what is said in the book if somebody wants to go into the specifics of dating we can go into it separately so his own is devamrit maharaj has written a book called searching for vedic india where he talks elaborately about uh, the dating of the texts and what are the problems with it but one quick point is that you know, jainism buddhism at least is understood by historians to have been to have originated in pre pre christian times and jains and buddhists they were no fans of krishna and his teachings they have criticized him and while criticizing him they have criticized sometimes his ethical character sometimes his teachings and none of them over thousands of years before have have divorced krishna and the bhagavad gita from the mahabharat so this idea of divorcing the two is a relatively modern phenomena okay now one last question and then we will stop now why why did shri prabhupada refer to his commentary as it is so basically prabhupada never claimed exclusivity he only claimed authenticity there's a difference exclusivity means that this is the only right commentary no prabhupada drew from other commentators in the tradition and not just in his own tradigodia tradition he resp- he referred to ramanuja acharya's commentary he referred to commentaries by other by teachers in other traditions also so <clears throat> his claim saying that is as it is what does it mean prabhupada himself says in the bhagavad gita that in his bhagavad gita introduction that the bhagavad gita was spoken by krishna to arjuna for a particular purpose and that purpose was clear from the context itself arjuna after hearing the bhagavad gita i'll discuss the subject more elaborately later but quick answer over here that arjuna after hearing the bhagavad gita in the 8 10 chapter itself says krishna i accept you as the supreme and at the end of the bhagavad gita arjuna becomes a devotee of krishna or at least acts in a devotional way karishye vachanam tava i will do your will so the bhagavad gita is essentially spoken to address the question of dharma and dharma has two things sadhya and sadhana what is it that is to be achieved and how is it to be achieved and the bhagavad gita reveals from what arjuna himself has learned that the sadhya then the objective is krishna and the sadhan is bhakti so when prabhupada says bhagavad gita as it is that means he keeps this original purpose of the bhagavad gita clear in his commentaries and now can the bhagavad gita give other wisdom yes there is a lot of other wisdom in the bhagavad gita and that can also be uh, drawn from it 
But if that other wisdom is made into the conclusion of the Gita or the essence of the Gita, then that becomes a problem because the Bhagavad Gita is a, at least in the Indian tradition, is a very well-known book. So many people have tried to justify their own philosophies by by claiming that it is that the Bhagavad Gita says their philosophy. And that is what Srila Prabhupada had strong issues with. That now the Bhagavad Gita itself is open to multiple explanations. But from the context, the Bhagavad Gita leads to one conclusion in terms of the understanding and the actions of the original student of the Gita. So in terms of that faithfulness to the original intent of the Gita, Prabhupada's commentary is very clear. So in that sense, Bhagavad Gita as it is, is a, is a declaration of the authenticity of the commentary with the original conclusion of the Gita as revealed in the Gita itself. Specific explanations can be multiple. And Prabhupada himself said at times that he would like to write another commentary on the Gita. So it's not a claim to exclusivity. It's a <coughs> pointer to authenticity. So thank you very much for your attention. There are some other questions remaining, which we will answer separately. And I'll send the answers on the WhatsApp group. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai.